thanks for joining us. Um, I suggest that uh, if you're <clears throat> uh, sticking around uh, for the chat back, my name is Chris Bungard, um, and sorry for the state of welcoming you to my living room with my small children's mess all about me, but that's the best I can do. In COVID, we are classics, faculty, and most of us not excessively well paid after all. Um, no, but uh, for the, uh, yeah, th thank for the clapping that I'm seeing um, and all the, the great things popping up here in the, in the, uh, the chat. Uh, for the uh, talk back, uh, when we were uh, discussing kind of how to organize this, um, I, I think that um, what we'll probably do is uh, hear it a little bit um, once the uh, all, all the congratulations. Hopefully, Cast, you're enjoying this outpouring of, of enthusiasm there in the chat. Um, once that's died down a little bit, um, uh, what we'll do is, if you would like to ask any questions, um, please just type your um, your your question in the chat, um, and and then what I will do, um, just as a way to kind of uh, facilitate the conversation, is I'll, I'll read the questions that you post there um, out to the uh, to the members of the cast, um, and, and that's the way we'll go about it. Um, and as a way to kind of get this conversation rolling uh, while you continue all of your wonderful support for the hard work that the camp players have put in, um, you know, I know, I know one of the things that um, that I found interesting um, and and quite impressive was um, just the, just the work of all the different components that went into this, right? I mean, obviously there's the art, um, you know, that's behind all of all of the actors there. Um, to make you feel a little bit more like you're in a play, um, you know, sort of a, a live performance in person kind of experience, you know, but we also had um, the music. And so I was wondering, uh, John Franklin, um, who who, uh, who did a lot of the music here, um, could you talk a little bit about um, just the, the process of suggesting this show and, and your experience um, in, in kind of putting together the music for the show? Sure. Um, so we put this uh, show on in 2018 here in Burlington, Vermont. You see Lake Champlain behind me. Um, we did it as a, a new translation by students, alumni, and faculty of the University of Vermont in honor of Phil Ambrose, uh, an emeritus professor here who um, did a lot of work with tragedy um, when he was teaching here. So instead of a festriff, we put on a play for him. So we like the idea of having uh, each of the parts be um, translated by a different person so they would all have their own voice. Uh, plus it was a kind of crowd uh, sourcing of the labor. Um, so we put that on, um, uh, you know, it's sort of an outreach effort. And, you know, for that purpose, I wanted to choose a play that wasn't all doom and gloom. And I, I've, uh, I like the Helen a lot and I like the Egyptian setting. Glynis, uh, who did the artwork, likes uh, to do sort of Egyptian style um, artwork, um, but mainly because I wanted, you know, I, I like, I was attracted to the comedic dimensions of the play, which, um, you know, we've uh, played up as best we could, but of course they're, they're um, in the play to a certain extent. So um, that, that was kind of the, the bigger um, kind of focus of the project, but for my own part, I wanted to have an opportunity to work on some ancient music for the play. It's an area that my research is in. So um, these are songs which follow the meter of Euripides as closely as I was able to interpret them, um, those complex shifting meters. Um, the melodies follow the ancient accents. Uh, Anna Concert, who is here, has just written a dissertation on this topic. Um, so you can look out for that. But the, these melodies uh, in both strophe and antistrophe follow the accents exactly according to the observable rules in the surviving scores of ancient music. And in terms of accompaniment, I, I don't have an loss, the double pipe that was the normal instrument for drama, but I have this uh, lyre here, which is of a Canaanite, you know, 14th century BC. You can't really see it with the, uh, the background keeps cutting out, but it's um, appropriate to the dramatic setting. So even though uh, we've sort of violated the actual performance um, conventions of fifth century Greek drama, we've provided music that is uh, somewhat appropriate to uh, Bronze Age Egypt with electricity added. Um, so that's sort of how the music came together. Uh, Julia Irons, who uh, played the chorus in this production, played Helen in the original. So she knew uh, all of the music already. 
And because she was uh, starting a PhD program in Chicago and because the SCS was going to be in Chicago this year, we put forward the proposal um, to do it there thinking, you know, the, the most difficult part the, to prepare the music um, when it was sort of already in the bag. Um, and then unfortunately, of course, uh, COVID, uh, you know, interrupted the show. And so consulting with Krishni, we decided to go ahead and try it as a Zoom production. I had never done one. Um, I hadn't seen many of them. Um, and I think, so we had a lot of challenges kind of adapting to that. Um, but, um, you know, we, we sort of pushed the limits of Zoom uh, to the limits, which are, you know, which are, are you know, immediate, you know, th the limits are right there. There's not a lot you can do. So the virtual backgrounds really help with the immersive experience. And then the only way we could do the music was through pre-recorded videos. We tried lip syncing. We tried uh, live performance, the timing issues and latency with the different video feeds made it impossible. So we decided to go ahead with it. Um, Mary Kay Gamel, I had seen a production of her uh, Euripides Orestes in Santa Cruz and it had been blown away by that. Now she had brought out dark humor and sort of unexpected uh, elements in the Euripides. So I was really keen to have a chance to work with her. So I invited her to come and direct. And we, um, you know, we got into the rehearsals and I had never done anything with camp. So it was really uh, fascinating to see how uh, they work as a collaborative group. Um, it, it was really is a joint production. Everybody put in their own original um, touches to, you know, how to work within the Zoom space, obviously uh, interpreting their characters, but collaborating with each other to create uh, amusing interplays. And it really um, a brilliant job there. So I think, um, I think that about says it all. You know, this, this, we did the sort of the best we could under the circumstances. And I, and I hope, uh, and, and watching the show in the audience tonight, it really like the last few rehearsals, each one took a, a big jump and then this one was over the top good. So I'm glad it worked out so well. Thanks, John. Um, actually, uh, some of your comments, I think, segue really nicely into some of the comments or the questions that are popping up. Um, and, and thanks to Christian and Amy, I was, I was reminded that we do have a Q&A tab. Um, so if you want to ask questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A tab. Um, but um, and I, I apologize if I, if I may mispronounce any names along the way. Um, Yuan de Cabrera Ortega had asked, um, you know, for the cast, uh, how, I, given the kind of mix of tragedy and comedy, um, you know, how, how did that play into the way that you all prepared uh, for the production that we saw? I, I might jump in here um, as the designated final um, assistant. <laughs> I, you know, I, it's one of these things that, you know, when you read this play with students, you sort of uh, see the potential in, in comedy, but it's never until you actually sort of start working lines that you really see um, the, the huge number of, of, of moments of comic potential. And there was a, a bit of push-pull where I would sometimes say in rehearsal, do we really want to go there, right? Like this is potentially a very touching moment, but sort of Menelaus being a dum-dum is undermining it. But, you know, it, it didn't feel like something we were putting onto the play, but really something there in, in this rather strange but, but fascinating play. I agree, Rob. I think uh, we we started our rehearsal process quite a while ago, um, and I certainly did not go into this thinking that it was going to be comic in the slightest. And then as we discovered, like you're saying, as we actually worked the lines and analyzed and discovered what was there, it very much took a organic shift toward the comic, and I think it worked really well in the end. Um, there's, there's a question from, um, and those of you with your hands up, I, I see them. Um, I'm working my way towards you. Um, so, so thanks for, for putting your hands up there. And, I, and I'll uh, try to um, I keep your hands up, though, um, until I call on you, just so I don't I'll lose track of you there. Um, but um, Fran Titchener was wondering, um, the other part of, of what John was saying, um, I think leads nicely into Fran's question, which is uh, for Mary Kay in particular in... Uh, kind of thinking about your earlier production of Helen and this one, could you talk a little bit about um, your, your own experience between those two? Is this a question for Julia or for? Uh, I, I think it's for, uh, it's for Mary Kay, but. Um, Mary Kay, Mary Kay, yeah. Uh, Mary Kay, I think you might still be muted or, or I'm not hearing you. Um, it's, hmm, I don't, I'm not sure. I can hear you now. Okay, great. Okay, um, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's it's strange it is it is strange to think of i mean a lot of people think that greek drama is as serious as can be 
And of course, it should be somewhat serious, and it all, it all depends. But but comedy makes the, makes things more serious if done if done right, and if there's a balance there, and that's what what everyone was 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 working at. at I, if I may speak for myself, I found the, the the music and the backgrounds just overwhelming, just fantastic, and so that, for that, John deserves the credit, and that was was fabulous. Just fabulous. But I mean, again, everybody, everybody worked hard. Everybody had something to had a lot to say and a lot to do. And it's it's just it's wonderful. And I was I was completely mystified by Zoom. <laughs> I had never done any Zoom before. And but then seeing seeing people, you know, and the say as you can as you can see them now, uh, on, right right next to each other and and it makes it, it and it works. It's really fascinating. So I'm 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 intensely intensely grateful. Um, and, and I apologize that 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 uh, question actually was apparently really from Mark Damon. Um, but but uh, Zoom Zoom misled me a little bit. Um, actually, uh, Mary Kate, your, your last comment I, and this is for the the whole cast. Um, I think leads nicely into a question from John Gruber Miller, um, who's wondering about um, you know the, the play as you produced it um, because it was so well produced. Um, seemed really readily adapted to Zoom, um, kind of given the long speeches and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so he was curious about just how hard it was for you to actually adapt it to the Zoom format. Well, if I could jump in for this one, um, pretty much we didn't. The text is the text as John Franklin and the UVA folks gave it to us. Uh, a lot of what we did was trying to uh, adapt to the business that we couldn't do, the pushing, the grabbing. Um, I would say, though, that in terms of sort of the long descriptive speeches, especially the messenger speech, they just work beautifully over the Zoom format because they tell a distinct narrative. And, and just to add on that and underscore what Krishni said, you know, I think what, what I was missing really and, and the trouble was was the physicality right i mean when when helen and i were supposed to be sort of sexually suggestive or fighting or whatever we still have like the same zoom box to work with we can't really get any closer or further away so we we learned a lot about techniques in terms of like zooming in or leaning back or turning and things like that that um were just sort of things that we made up on the fly because we had to or things wouldn't work Adding to what Rob just said, you're in constant uh, close up all the time. So it's a different kind of playing that we usually do at camp. Um, it's, it's a little less physical and a little more personal. Uh, one of the advantages though, is we don't have our scripts in our hands. So. <laughs> I think that's another part of, of the challenges with Zoom is eye placement too. <laughs> <laughs> like we we are still having to read a script, but it's on the screen and then we have to like try to attempt to know what's going on visually and what the audience is actually seeing, making sure we're staying in frame and all of that. Um, and then also like if we're in a scene and there's two of us, okay, I can look at the camera and talk to the other character. But then if someone else enters the scene, are they still the camera? Like it's hard to place people, um, which we also played with a lot uh, in this show, like when uh, Thea Clemenis and uh, Rob and I, Menelaus and I have a scene together and I'm like gesturing to Menelaus in the corner and then I have to like keep my eye on the king, but then it's very complicated and it takes a while to find your like comfy spot, I think, but um, it, you have to be intentional. Like I, like Rob said, I think the choice must be made one way or another and then you have to stick with it until it feels comfortable. A special shout out to uh, both Amy and Krishni also for doing the, the, the mega tech, but we're also all kind of our own techies within our own little bubbles. Uh, we have to turn on our mics, we have to be aware that our green screens don't fall down on us and things like that. Everybody's got to make sure their lighting works. <laughs> or their microphone. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm going to allow uh, Stephen Scully to talk. Uh, he has a question. Um, so Stephen, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself here. Um, 
and and I think you should be able to unmute yourself and ask your question. Go ahead. I don't have a question. I don't know why that came up. I just have a delight. I was totally oh, okay. <laughs> oh, that's okay. <laughs> Thank you all. It was brilliant, and and uh, you all made the uh, uh, you you transported us. You were you really did capture our imagination beautifully. Um, the individual uh, shots were wonderfully worked in relation to each other. I mean, it was integrated as a as a unit, even though you're all individualized. It really worked beautifully. All right, thanks, Stephen. Um, I'm gonna, um, uh, let's see, Robin from Melbourne, I, I think you might have a question or your hands up at least. So if you wanna talk, feel free to. <laughs> uh, well, maybe maybe I'll maybe I'll assume that uh, she, she she too um, uh, her hand went up for 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 some reason, but uh, uh, had, had not so much. Um, okay, well, um, to get back to a few more questions in the Q and A chat uh, for for our cast here, um, Angelina Wong was curious about um, it was really well produced considering the circumstances. How did the cast feel while performing virtually? not physically interacting as they traditionally would. Um, and also curious about the instrumentation. What was the woodwind played uh, toward the end? So sort of two questions there. Um, but let, let's handle the first one first. And I think uh, you've started to talk about it, but if anybody wants to add to it, um, uh, Amy, if you want to uh, chime in, uh, feel free. It, it seems like you're interested in, in talking about that in particular. If you could talk about um, your experience of, of not performing uh, physically, but virtually. And anybody else jump on in from there? Well, I wasn't doing much performing, so um, uh, I what struck me this time and in other shows that I've worked on since the pandemic started is how surprisingly much joy of rehearsal you do get. We do feel like we're in a, um, a wonderfully intense, engaged intellectual effort together, and you know. It, we regret the circumstances. We wish we were hanging out with each other and fitting each other's costumes and, and messing with each other's makeup and it would be great. Um, and going to the bar afterwards. But, uh, <laughs> but the, uh, less is lost than, than I worried about and the richness of the time was still there. So um, as, Far, as far as I mean, I think I'm I, partly I'm, I get to see the questions too, so I may be answering somebody else, else's questions. But in rehearsal, it it felt as productive, um, and um, so I'll I'll ask other people who are much greater parts of the cast to talk about what it felt like performing virtually. I'm not usually a performer. Anybody? At the risk of, of talking too much, I'll jump in. Um, and just say the hardest part is, is not being able to see the person you're talking to, right? Trying to do a scene with somebody. And, you know, I have my, my setup here in such a way that like I can look past the camera at my script, um, but there's no room in that setup for actually looking at Helen, for example. And so trying to have a really touching, lovely scene without looking at her and seeing her respond and just taking it for granted that she's probably responding in a reasonable way, but but you lose the ability to have those really dynamic in the moment kind of uh, exchanges of, of glances and things like that. And, and that's something that I found myself missing out on. Uh, I also really find the uh, screen restricting. Uh, I would have liked to make much larger gestures, but if I like leave this box, of course you can't see me. Uh, there was an incident in rehearsal where I knocked my lamp completely off of my platform. So, you know. Actually, um, uh, that, that might lead nicely into a, a question from Alexander J. Holman, um, who, who's kind of curious about you, know, like in antiquity, obviously, you know, masks would have imposed certain restrictions, um, you know, upon actors. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, they, they enable certain other kinds of things. And so um, Alexander's interested in uh, the question about could the restrictions imposed by Zoom 
be like the restrictions of masks, tolerable and even helpful in focusing attention. Um, so yeah, I wonder if, if, if anybody wants to respond to that or kind of uh, go from there and thinking about um, you know the way that this Zoom format might uh, have interesting analogs to ancient uh, mask usage one way or the other. Yes, is what I would say. As someone who uses masks regularly, um, it, uh, I think that um, Alexander's question and, and also Jay Bailey asked a similar question. Um, I think it's um, figuring out how to connect with an audience, how to make the most, I mean, and the other restrictions um, or limitations or conventions, really, the, the rules you have to live within. We have, we're having to learn within new rules, and so we got to find new um, creative ways to use those rules. I found myself thinking about the three-actor rule a lot. As somebody who comes on very early in the show and has time to sit back, I was trying to think, you know, what else could I have played if, if you were really restricted to three actors? Oh, yeah. Um, you know, th there's a, a couple of questions here that have to do with um, kind of costuming and, and makeup choices, and, and, and maybe we'll go there next. Um, one of our anonymous attendees um, was kind of curious for Menelaus and for uh, the servant of Menelaus there. Um, you know, your costumes look, uh, the anonymous attendee says, your costumes look like they were actually rescued from a shipwreck. Um, How did you achieve this effect? And I guess more generally in, in, in the discussion, right? Um, you know, in coordinating all of this, uh, could somebody talk about um, just kind of uh, the way the costuming came together for this performance? Uh, I, I will say my, my shipwreck costume is, is just a, a bed sheet and some cheap rope and a little bit of creativity. Um, but, but the real star of the costuming show, as often with camp shows, is, is Christine Burns. Bob does himself an injustice. He was much inspired by the Little Mermaid for this particular look. <laughs> and I thought, well, can I jump in and say that Julia is wearing a costume from our original production that was um, um, assembled by or uh, put together by uh, Rachel Cosgrove, who was our customer there, and she is actually on this um, call. It looks like so. I'm glad, and glad she can make it. She made the costumes for the whole cast of the original production and they're absolutely gorgeous. Hundreds of hours. The, the original performance is on YouTube if you want to see the rest of the costumes and they're, they're fantastic. Um, she, she also made this um, Philistine feather headdress that's not showing up so well here. I wish you could see it better. There it is. That um, Two Cross wore in the original show and he's in some of the animations. But David, did you actually, um, to what lengths did you go to to achieve your look? So, um, <laughs> so, so a pretty similar process to Rob. Uh, I soaked it in, we soaked it, I soaked it in coffee, uh, which, and I crumpled it up to try to get it to be stained unevenly. Uh -huh. it, it ended up staining it relatively evenly. So I sprayed it with bleach cleaner, which <laughs> to run. So that was. <laughs> With that, so. and, and I think that answers another part of the, the uh, questions out there too was you know to what extent was um, a lot of the costuming kind of just done individually um, you know versus uh, you know sort of a more centralized costuming effort uh, it, it sounds I mean not in unusual camp fashion um, that everybody was asked to kind of uh, pull together things you know but um, if I'm remembering right and I apologize if I'm not uh, uh, Willie and Emily, uh, you, you you both did, didn't you both have a similar neck kind of piece, or no? Yeah. Or, or is that just a figment of my imagination? Yeah, no. We, it, that was um, one thing that that sort of camp bought was these beaded collars that that Willie and I both wore. Um, but like this costume that I have, this is this is a costume I made when I played Medea a couple years ago. <laughs> so, um, but it worked, and so you know it, it got. They got a second turn on stage, so to speak. Fair enough. Well, you know, and I think that that um, sort of leads nicely into um, kind of questions about makeup um, and and the choices <laughs> about makeup, because obviously the sort of Egyptians, you know, have a particular style, um, you know, that I think those those beaded neck collars, you know, helped emphasize, but also obviously the eye makeup. Um, and, uh, you know, could you, could you as a, a cast kind of talk us through 
um, you know, those decisions a little bit. Christy said, use all the eyeliner. Uh, Knowing that we would only, our costumes would only be significant from, um, you know, the collarbone up, we decided that it was important to emphasize differences in the face and the makeup. Um, so indeed, the Egyptians used all of the eyeliner. I think I just spent more time putting my makeup on than I actually spent on stage. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, I mean, this is actually like, um, is getting me thinking um, a little bit about uh, last year's camp production too, right? And, and like, you know, sort of we in classics is that a tremendously white field, um, you know, uh, you know, like how, how do we, when we do productions, you know, how, how do we, how do we choose to handle, um, you know, sort of characters who are ethnically marked as different from, you know, the majority of the characters and how do you do it in, um, you know, less problematic kind of ways. Um, and, and, and so something as simple as the eye makeup seemed like a nice way to kind of mark that difference between Egyptians and Greeks, you know, I think that would have been there for Euripides audience as like, these are non-ethnically us, you know, um, but, but, but in, in hopefully, you know, sort of respectable, um, you know, ways. So yeah, yeah, it, it's really interesting. Um, Sorry, so I'm, I'm trying to kind of get through all of this. Um, Larissa Antoinette Shipley has a question for all of you. Anybody who wants to take it, um, what was your favorite part about preparing for this performance? I think uh, just experimenting in general, like everyone has been saying this whole time, like we don't know how to use this format. Um, so in rehearsal, having the opportunity to um, enact the analyzation that went into it, um, and see what works and what does not, because certainly a lot of it on my behalf did not, but you have like, we have this lovely cast of people and we're all seeing the same thing on the screen. So there's a lot of feedback as opposed to just, you know, the director having input. Um, we have a lot of voices that can be taken into account to hone the process and figure out what does work. I enjoyed all of the rehearsals, but I would say my favorite part was watching it come together in the dress rehearsal, the music, the animation, all of the the, um, the, the cuts from scene to scene, I'm watching it coalesce. Yeah, uh, uh, th th those comments, uh, I think, sort of lead nicely into Fran's question, Fran Titchener's question um, about has the role of director changed with the need to coordinate all these different venues um, and all this different kind of components uh, that were part of this show. Hmm. Well, I, I guess maybe maybe I'll. I mean, it, it was. I, I had no interest in being director. I just wanted to present music and then you know have have the play happen around me. So that's why I invited Mary Kay, and then uh, the two of us got into the group with Camp, and um, they you know there's a whole culture I I, I gather um, or I've experienced um, of the Camp group that and people are repeat performers in each production, and so they have a sort of a culture um, among themselves for uh, co-directing. And Krishni Burns did a lot of interpretive work. I mean, she guided us uh, through kind of how they you know, how they do rehearsals. And we spent a number of the, uh, for one thing, uh, usually these shows are put together over just a couple of days during the actual uh, conference. We had the sort of luxury in a way of meeting once a week for throughout the fall, um, which was quite a lot of rehearsal time, but it gave us the opportunity to um, read through the, um, text together and interpret it as we went. And that, help, that helped us kind of establish connections between parts and what, what we wanted to emphasize. Sometimes we went back to the Greek text to look at uh, translation ambiguities. And, um, and Amy uh, Cohen also uh, played a major role there as well. And, and the two of them did a lot of production, technical production work and um, ideas. And then you know all of the different players, and in a way, everybody was you know a director. I, I would say so. It was uh, for me. I, I don't have a lot of ex experience with that sort of thing, but I would say it's a, it's maybe unique to this group or, or a, a, um, particular to this group to work in that way. I would like to jump in at this point on the heels of what John just said, uh, and throw out an invitation uh, to the cast and crew, as well as to all of you out there in Zoom land. If you like this, if you enjoyed watching it or being in it. We have a, another group now that we just formed last year with a lot of people from this group called Tigger, Theater in Greece and Rome. And we were, we had, Amy actually led us through um, a Sophocles play last spring on Zoom. 
where, which was kind of like a training ground in some ways for some of the things we did here. Um, we were hoping to be live in Cleveland, uh, my hometown, this uh, spring for CAMWIS, but it looks like it's going to be on Zoom. So we'll be doing something much on a much smaller scale uh, like this with Podesty's Amphitryon. So if you're interested in getting involved and you're not already on the Tigger list, uh, just write to me uh, at Case Western and we'd be delighted to have you. We turn away no one. <laughs> um, definitely do that. Um, Plotus is wonderful. Uh, one of my favorites, obviously. And Cleveland is an amazing city. Um, I just say that as a shameless plug for somebody who's from Northeast Ohio original. Um, Anyway, and, and Krishna supports me there. Um, anyway, uh, and Nancy Iron has asked, uh, she'd like more information on all the artwork. Was it all original? Was it all from one artist? Were there guidelines of color, clear drawing for specific moods? Uh, maybe I would add to Nancy's question, um, you know, it, did the artwork come from the original UVM production or was it specific to uh, this Zoom production? Well, uh, I, I'm, my name's Glynis Fox, and I'm married to John. That's why we're in the same space here. Um, I drew everything for this. Uh, a lot of it was from the original production, um, like the temple background um, primarily. Uh, and for Zoom, John added a lot more animated effects between images. And he also used a lot more images that came from other projects. And I might have drawn a few things new for this production, but not very many. He, he went through my work from the past 20 or 30 years and, and found images that fit um, um, to put these animations together. So, so what if I could jump in there because you have more I know you want to say, but there, there's um, we, we got to a point where we realized that the uh, lip syncing and live performance was just not going to work. And then uh, Krishna was like, well, I, I, anyway, we got to the point where we had like a week to like put four, four animated videos together for songs that we thought we were going to be able to do live were more of them. And suddenly and I, I felt like I couldn't, the reason we waited so long is I, I didn't want to ask Glennis to draw anymore because she's so busy. And so I just started going through my hard drive for all different stuff. A lot of the artwork came from a game uh, that we that we have half developed called the Stormy Seas of Cyprus, um, a game of epic wanderings and the hunt for Helen. So it's basically about the multiform myth world that this play relates to and sort of pirates and like sacking cities and the sea peoples and the, you know, the collapse of the bronze age, but we had a ton of artwork for that. So the original show was mainly line drawings, but this game had a lot of more cartoony um, stuff. And so that kind of, you know, expanded the, the range of imagery into, you know, paint. and then we also had a bunch of paintings that she had done sometimes 20 years ago relating to Helen or Iphigenia and Taurus. So there's a combination in the end of paintings, these cartoons, and then the line drawings that are more closely based on ancient uh, vase art and other things like that. So it ended up being quite a melange of, but all of Glynis's original work. So it had a, had a unity there too, a unity and a diversity. I, I realize I've liked this or been interested in this play for about 30 years, but also um, the, the original, for the original play, there were well, there was a chorus of seven, was it that that did complex dances in front of uh, PowerPoint slideshows, and those were much simpler because there was so much going on on the stage. And for this, when you're seeing just the screen, um, um, it, it's it, we realized it needed more, and that's where um, John uh, went to town with iMovie. Yeah. And um, the, the, one, of the, one of the goals of having the imagery behind the chorus was to let an audience that was not familiar with the myths, because um, these, these are complicated lyrics and there's a lot of illusions and they go by really fast and be, you know, before you have any idea what's happening, it's over. So the idea was to have uh, images to supply uh, what an original audience would have had in their minds for associations and uh, you know, interpretive things that would have been obvious to them could then be supplied through visuals, even if you didn't really make as clear a connection as an ancient audience would have, you could at least see that there was a, a coherent world of illusions and interrelations happening. And I think the, the um, images uh, succeed in doing that well. So um, 
just thank you very much, um, Jerry, for putting my website there. And I do have a store, but it's um, for books that I'm, I, yeah, my books, but um, I'm working on two books that are about the Bronze Age right now. So that's, that's my future. Um, sorry, I'm trying to figure, figure out where we go from, from here. Um, One, one, one question. Um, well, I, I think you answered it, John. Uh, that um, the, the UVM production happened kind of before uh, the whole COVID shutdown, uh, or you were able to do it live, right, at UVM? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Somebody was asking, kind of. Obviously, everybody's kind of spread out right now, but um, in the original production, you were able to do it in person and live. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, well, to, could I expand briefly on that? Yeah, feel free to. It's available on YouTube. There's a whole, um, you know, if you search Euripides, Helen, UVM, or Vermont, you'll come up with a whole playlist of the actual show and then a lot of related things, rehearsals and, video, you know. Um, but we, we combined a production um, with a city Dionysia. So we had a bunch of local Vermont winemakers come and provide wine to the audience. We had four guest lecturers provide contextual lectures. Um, and well, I guess I guess that sort of sums it up. But um, so we had when we, we tried to do it again last year with Aristophanes Clouds. We had support from the uh, Classics Everywhere SCS uh, grant, and uh, we were a week away from um, opening night. We had Rachel Cosgrove doing costumes there uh, too. Uh, Rachel Fickus, who played the Outlaws or Double Pipe, um, Angelina Wong was asking about that. She put she played. Uh, in the, she was playing in the Clouds production. She had learned the double pipes for that production. We had a lot of stuff going on. They got canceled at the last minute, unfortunately. Um, Rachel played Alos um, on the second Stasimon, the second to last song in this production. And just yesterday, or maybe two days ago, she sent me her pipe part that she recorded on two phones uh, as a, you know, as a sound file. And I had to slide, you know, I slid it into the um, thing at the last minute. So I, I was, it was too late to get her on the credits, but I want to I give her a shout out because she's, she went to um, Toronto to study with Robin Howell, one of the few outlaws makers, and she, it's an extremely difficult instrument. She's uh, made a lot of uh, progress with it. Great. Um, I, I think that we I think that we've addressed uh, the the questions here. Um, Olga Lavani, uh, just knows real quick. Um, make sure I get I get your. Uh, comment question in here that she uh, really loved uh, Coral Oats with Glynis's animated drawings. Any thought about how to bottle that, possibly adding footnotes to the images that are referenced? Um, and and, and I, I don't know if you want to say anything about that um, or if there's any thoughts about making the, uh, the recordings um, for this production kind of available, um, you know, after the production. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I imagine we'll have it up on YouTube if everyone agrees. Yeah. Great. Uh, is there anything else? Anybody else in the cast uh, wants to to talk about? I think I'd just like to say that this has been a very different experience than our usual camp productions. Generally, we show up the Wednesday before uh, the conference starts and rehearse like crazy for 48 hours. Uh, it was John's idea to instead rehearse steadily over the about, what, two and a half months before the show. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I think that we collectively, particularly our cast, have produced a really wonderful production, and I'm very proud to have been a part of it. Yeah. Well, um, I'd like to thank the cast again for all of the, the great work you put in. I really enjoyed the show from, from the confines of my living room. Um, and, and, and thanks for all your work over the last uh, two and a half months or, or so. Um, for those of you uh, who are out there in the audience still, um, I would encourage you, um, as, as somebody who's been involved in past camp performances, but not this year's, um, and, and sadly I'm, I'm missing it in this moment, um, would have, uh, in retrospect, really like to have been part of the show, um, but that's on me. Um, no, but I would really encourage all of you, uh, you know, <clears throat> feel free to hop in and get involved. As Krishni says, uh, camp takes everybody, regardless of your ability, we'll find a use for you. Um, so, so please do. And even if you don't want to be, 
you know, on stage when that fateful day arrives in the future when we're all able to do live performances in the same room. Um, you know, even if you don't want to be on stage, there's always plenty of room to be done, you know, in whatever talents you might bring. Um, those of you planning on participating in CAMWIS, please, again, uh, think about uh, reaching out to Tim there um, and joining Plotus' Amphitryon uh, for Tigger's, I think, uh, first inaugural uh, official performance. Um, the, the, the event last, uh, CAMWIS was sort of the, the uh, early stages of the formation of this group. Um, so I think this will be the, the, the first official Tigger performance at CAMWIS, um, and it would be great to have a, a very strong first outing there. So please uh, do not hesitate to reach out to Tim um, and, and get involved with that show. I plan to do that. Um, and uh, thanks for a great evening. Um, I, I don't really know what else to say, and I feel like there's not a good way to end the, uh, you know, the question and answer. I feel like it fizzles out and we just say, like, thanks, everybody, and everybody walks out the door, but obviously, on Zoom, I guess you wave, right? And so goodbye, everybody, and have a great evening. Thank you for coming.